Hello, First Baptist Church family. It's good to be speaking with you. Uh, I assume many of you, if not all of you, will be watching this on Palm Sunday. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to think about the narrative of what Jesus did for us in going to Jerusalem, going to the cross, and being raised for us. And we will be talking about that a little bit uh, in, our, in our sermon, and we'll be uh, singing about that a little bit in our songs as well. I have one announcement that I would like to share with you. We were scheduled to have Luke Warner, who is one of our missionaries, come and give an update and preach for us. And he was going to do the whole day for us on Palm Sunday, a sermon and an update. And uh, we obviously were not able to do that. And I, I spoke with Luke, and he was able to uh, give us a video update. That'll be on our website. That'll be on our YouTube page. And I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, and one of the reasons I would encourage you to check that out is that one of the things that we can do to really take advantage of the time that God has given a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us during this virus crisis uh, is that we can really improve our prayer lives. We can pray for those in our church and we can pray for our missionaries. We can just grow in interceding and also just communing with the Lord. Uh, and so I would encourage you to pray for our missionaries. I would encourage you to pray for the Warners and, and take a look at that video. I also just wanted to mention, uh, if you are looking for things to do with your family by way of family devotions, I would just encourage you. Uh, there are many wonderful passages. There are many wonderful resources. One thing I would encourage you you might want to do uh, is to continue to read and study 2 Corinthians, passages we've covered, passages we are yet to cover. And the reason I say that uh, is because it will help you uh, when you listen to the sermon series but also because there's something powerful about our church body thinking about a passage together, growing and walking through a passage together. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to do that. Uh, read it as a family, study it with your family, read a study tool. That's all I have for this week. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to have uh, Don Weitzel come and give the scripture reading. After he does that, we actually are going to sing a couple of live songs Dawn Saylor, who has been helping us with the videos, will be playing with us, and, and a, a friend from a brother, a sister church, uh, Jack Underwood, uh, will be here with us, and we'll be singing a couple of live songs. That'll be in addition to a couple of YouTube, so that you still get five songs, but I hope you'll enjoy that. And so now I'll have Don come and read the scripture. Hello, church family. I hope you're all doing well. Um, we're living in unprecedented times in our world today, and uh, we're all forced to kind of slow down and, and think more. Uh, we have a lot of time on our hands. And, you know, it's a time when God is reminding us that he's in control. Um, you know, it, it uh, seems like in times like these, we need, really need to stop and use wisdom, uh, be in prayer, and not forget that God is in control. And, uh, you know, he has the power in our world. A few weeks ago, Brother Eddie Stanbaugh read for us from Philippians chapter 4, um, and his timing was impeccable. Uh, if you remember that, it's a passage that I often read uh, when I'm kind of struggling. Uh, I read it, you know, a lot. And uh, the sixth verse in that chapter reads, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, no <clears throat> be made known to God. You know, it's easy in times like this for, to be anxious. There's a lot of things uh, that we worry about right now, our family, our health. Um, but again, I think it's time for us to just slow down and remember that God's in control. Um, you know, during these times, we have to rely on our faith to get us through. And, um, you know, we must have an unwavering faith in these times. So I'd like to read a few verses from Hebrews, I'd like to start in chapter 11 with verses one through three. It says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. We can also continue reading about the faith <clears throat> of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, the faith of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the faith of Moses and the Israelites as they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. In verses 30 and 31, it reads, 
by faith the walls of Jericho fell, fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And in Matthew 17 and 20, Jesus tells us, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And then getting back to Hebrews chapter 12, it's a couple more verses. It reads, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, as, as we uh, work through these times, we just need to be reminded to encourage each other, again, to use wisdom, be in prayer for one another, and not waver in our faith. And it, most of all, to just have a, a, a really strong foundation in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for wisdom and courage in these difficult times. Lord, strengthen our faith and let us be in prayer for one another. Let us stand strong as a church and be a light in the darkness. Lord, we lift you. We lift up to you our family and friends, those who are working with the public, those who are working in the grocery industry and in the medical field. We ask that you keep them safe, Lord. We pray for our senior saints and all of our church family that we may stay healthy and that we may be, we may be an encouragement to each other, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you be with us, that we may slow down and be still and know that you alone are in control. Let us reflect on our priorities during these times. Let us be thankful for the many blessings, Lord, that you've given us. Lord, just give us a generous spirit during these times that we may help those around us, those who are in need. And Lord, <clears throat> you know how far this virus will spread. Only you do. And uh, how difficult times will get. Lord, we just ask that you have mercy on this world, but in the end, your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Please join us in singing Grace Greater Than Our Sins and then Blessed Assurance. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God. Like the sea waves roll, threaten our soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge of my. 
songs that we're providing links to on our uh, website. Uh, all of these songs uh, are meant to point our attention to one of the themes that we're going to be talking about this week, and that is the, the control, the, uh, the impact that the gospel is meant to have on us, how it is meant to change our lives. Um, it's supposed to be a, a all-consuming part of who we are. And so uh, I chose the old hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, to emphasize the lifestyle of trusting in Jesus. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, one of our newer songs that we've enjoyed singing as a church, uh, with a similar theme of trusting Christ, but particularly through trials. And then one that's newer to some of you, I know it's been sung in specials at our church, but uh, Christ is mine forevermore. Uh, again, the song is talking about how our identity is entirely wrapped up in Christ. So I hope those songs are a blessing to you as you worship with your family this week. And now as we continue in 2 Corinthians, uh, we're actually going to slow down a little bit the next couple of weeks. Uh, throughout this series, I've preached half a chapter at times, a whole chapter at times, and I may do so again. But this week, we are going to just preach five verses and, and just take a few more next week to finish chapter five. And we're doing that because of the way these passages line up with these special days uh, that we're going to experience together the next two weeks. This week's passage will work very well for Palm Sunday, and next week's passage will work very well for Easter. Palm Sunday is called Palm Sunday as it reminds us of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which I've always found to be a completely fascinating event. Fascinating because it was prophesied. Fascinating because the people who uh, called out that this was the king were right, even though they didn't realize exactly what they were saying. A fascinating event because these crowds that were singing the praises of Jesus would soon mock him. And fascinating because Jesus knew what was coming and had gone to Jerusalem intent on providing the sacrifice for sinners who would be made into his bride. And it's that knowledge of Jesus, that awareness of Jesus, uh, that, that I've grabbed onto and thought would make this passage appropriate for this week. As we think about the death of Jesus, and as we think about how our lives should change as a result. 
So we're slowing down a little bit in 2 Corinthians. I'm actually doing something pretty unique for me. The first half of this sermon is going to be a topical sermon, and the second half will be from 2 Corinthians. And by doing that, I'm trying to accomplish two goals. My first goal is to help us think about the death of Jesus in a focused way. I believe that the death of Jesus is the most important event in the history of the world. I believe the death of Jesus is what the Bible is pointing to and, 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 and uh, it surrounds every uh, moral imperative in the Bible. And I believe that my preaching should always in some way help sinners understand more clearly what Christ did in his death to save them from their sins. But even though we always want to be talking about the gospel message, we always want to be talking about what Jesus did on the cross, there are times when we want to zoom in even more. And a series of special days like Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter are a good opportunity to zoom in. So my first goal in preaching like this is that we would focus on one particular aspect of Jesus' sacrifice of himself, and we'll talk about that in a minute. My second goal in preaching a message that is half topical and half from 2 Corinthians, besides continuing our series in 2 Corinthians, is that we would focus on one result of the gospel, one thing that changes in our life because of the gospel, and this result is displayed in Paul's life in this passage. And I'm going to tell you that result now uh, because that is where I get the title for my message. The result uh, of the gospel that we see in Paul's life is that his was a life controlled by the gospel. We're going to see this in our passage. Paul is continuing to work to show the Corinthians that his ministry has been shaped by the gospel. He does this so that they will realize that their problems with Paul are actually problems with the gospel. And it's in those circumstances and from Paul's teachings that we've been seeing all kinds of implications of the gospel. And our passage today tells us one of the most powerful implications of the gospel, one that really is a summary, one that is a a foundation for all other implications of the gospel, and that is that the gospel message of what Jesus Christ did completely controlled Paul's life and ministry. Paul's understanding of what Jesus did in dying for sinners controlled him. And there's a a second uh, reaction, application we want to take from that title. When I titled this message, A Life Controlled by the Gospel, I first meant that we will look at a life controlled by the gospel, the life Paul lived. But second, uh, the second meaning is the fact that Paul believed rightly that what Christ did for sinners actually demands demands that all Christians should live a life controlled by the gospel. So we have two reasons for this title, to look at a life controlled by the gospel and to be a life controlled by the gospel. So that's where we want to end up. We want to look at Jesus in a focused way. We want to see that those who are changed by the gospel are meant to live a life controlled by those realities. We want to look at King Jesus and live for King Jesus. And I just want to remark about how good this is for us, how good it is to live our lives under King Jesus. I want to point out that it's good in general first. I probably mention this verse every half dozen sermons or so because I love it so much, but what Jesus said in Matthew 11 captivates me where he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is a good master at all times. His way is a good way. His path of life is a good path for us to live in at all times. The Bible says many other things about why this is good at all times. 
Paul and Peter and the author of Hebrews all encourage people to have good conduct as a response to the gospel, and they all point out that this is a good lifestyle. Paul says, these things are excellent and profitable for people. Peter says that living a life controlled by the gospel keeps you from being ineffective or unfruitful. And the author of Hebrews talks about the fact that living a life controlled by the gospel may even lead to us being disciplined by God as a father, but even then, this will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So this is excellent and profitable from Paul. It keeps us from being ineffective or unfruitful from Peter. It leads us to the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It is good to follow King Jesus with a life controlled by the gospel at all times. It's also good in suffering to live this kind of life. This global health crisis has affected everyone differently, and some people feel like it hasn't affected them hardly at all. But at the very least, we have all been forced to think about suffering more than normal. And it is so good to follow King Jesus in a life controlled by the gospel in times of suffering. It's good because he is gentle. He is a gentle savior. Isaiah 42 says of Jesus that a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Isaiah 40 says he will take the lambs in his arms and gently lead those that are with young in your suffering or in your thinking about suffering, in your fears about the possibility of suffering, in your sorrow over others that are suffering, there is a gentle Savior in King Jesus. He is gentle. He's also near. Proverbs 18 indicates that there is a friend who is closer than a brother. Who, who is this friend that is closer than a brother? Well, Romans 8 says that Jesus considers us all brothers, and Hebrews 2 tells us that he is not ashamed to call us brothers. In fact, saying that he had to be made like his brothers. He just felt that he had to. He loved them so much. This is a wonderful promise, beloved. When we think of suffering, even in this particular type of suffering, that we have Jesus as a brother. He is gentle and he is near. And he isn't just a shoulder to cry on or a listening ear. He is an active savior in our suffering. The word tells us in multiple places that he prays for us, that he ever lives to pray for us. The word tells us he leads us through suffering. As an example, in 1 Peter, for Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Romans 6 tells us he leads us in the power of the resurrected life. There's a lesson there when we are fighting sin that because Jesus was raised, that that power is within us to fight sin. 1 Peter 2 tells us that he makes us acceptable to God, that our, our acts of spiritual worship are acceptable to God through Jesus. Beloved, it is good to follow King Jesus in general. It is good to follow King Jesus through suffering. And it is good to know that he is an active Savior who is praying for you right now. So in summary, beloved, our, our attitude about Jesus should be that of, of 1 Peter 1 8. That though we do not see him, we believe in him. Though we do not now see him, we love him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. If, if that's not the case for us, if that's not how we feel about Jesus, there's something, there's something missing in our understanding. There's something missing in our in our understanding and our, our yielding of our hearts to him. Jesus is to captivate our hearts, fill our lives with love and joy, and this will be what is most good for you, brother and sister in Christ, in any of season of life and in the seasons where we are most aware of suffering. And I also want to point out, if you're watching this, and you're thinking about Jesus, exploring Jesus, but you know in your heart that your life is not wrapped up in King Jesus, that you, you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to notice both that these benefits are wonderful, that this is a wonderful life, that this is a wonderful relationship that you can have with Christ. I want you to be attracted to this, 
But I also want to point out, I want you to be aware that God commands you to come to Jesus. In the last day, when people will be judged, they will not just be judged for their actions. But the Bible also says that they will be punished because they did not obey the gospel. Friend, if you're watching this and you've never given your life over to Jesus, if you've never trusted that his life and sacrifice can cause your sins to be forgiven, then not only are you missing out on the kind, wonderful Savior we're going to talk about, but the Bible says you're being disobedient. You're disobeying the gospel. Turn to Jesus now. Wherever we are coming from, whatever we are feeling this morning, we all want to be amazed in a fresh way when we think about what Jesus did. And so to begin today, I'd like to point out something specific about Jesus' sacrifice. And this is our first point, that Jesus gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Here's where I'm going with that. When we think about the story of Jesus' crucifixion, the events, the accounts of those events, we know that there were several responsible parties. We know that the religious leaders hated Jesus and that for some time they had been looking for a way to kill him. We know uh, they were responsible for this. We know that Judas betrayed Jesus. We know that Pilate failed to administer justice and bent to the will of the crowd. These are responsible actors. And all of these human actors are only doing what the Father had decreed for them to do, as the book of Acts says. In other words, uh, both things can be true. They are responsible, but they also did what God decreed for them to do. In other words, every action was under the sovereignty of God, who we know, as John 3.16 says, sent his only begotten Son because he loved the world and did so because he wanted to provide everlasting life to those who would believe in Jesus. But also, under the activity of the religious leaders and the crowd and Pilate and Judas and, and Peter who betrayed him and, and under the sovereignty of God the Father, there is also the fact that there is the sovereignty of Jesus, the Son, in giving himself for us. I want to highlight that Jesus' sacrifice was a conscious, sovereign, loving decision of Jesus Christ for you. This isn't my opinion. Uh, this isn't something I dreamed up that would be nice for us to think about today. This is what the Bible clearly teaches. When we think of Jesus riding on a donkey through the streets of Jerusalem, knowing that he would soon die, we need to remember what Luke 9.51 says, that when the day of his ascension was drawing near, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was there by his choice. When we think of Judas betraying Jesus, we need to remember that at the Last Supper, Jesus not only predicted that he would be betrayed, but looked at Judas knowing what he would do and said, what you go to do, do quickly. Jesus was sovereign over his betrayal. Using all the different gospel accounts, we see several um, things in Jesus' arrest that indicate he was sovereign there as well. When he saw the mob, he said, why do you have swords and clubs? You could have arrested me any time. In other words, I would never have gone uh, with a fight. When his disciples defended him and Peter cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Jesus not only stopped his defense, but took the time to heal the servant's ear. And listen to these stunning words from John 18. In the garden. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Think about what a scene that is. That when Jesus said, I am he, the power of God was visible because Jesus was using the divine name, I am, of himself. And he was right 
and in a mystery that I can't wait to find out about in heaven. The God-man attesting to his divinity knocked these hardened soldiers off of their feet. And in case we wonder if God uh, in the flesh, Jesus Christ, was sovereign in his arrest, he then waited for them to get up rather than running and rather than employing any of his divine power that he had just demonstrated so clearly he possessed. Beloved, Jesus was sovereign over his arrest. We can think of the mock trial and sentencing. We can think for a minute that that Pilate was in charge, but Jesus told him, uh, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus was sovereign even over his sentencing. He was sovereign over his being in Jerusalem, over his betrayal, sovereign over his arrest, sovereign over his sentencing. And that's without mentioning how Jesus knew of Peter's betrayal, how he had said many times that the Son of Man will give his life as a ransom for many, or how on the cross Jesus sovereignly gave up his spirit. All of these instances are proof of what Jesus said in John 19, where he said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus was and is sovereign. So, beloved, we know he gave himself for us. This was true at great cost. As he sweat great drops of blood, asking if there was any other way. But then saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was not swept away in a surprising set of circumstances. He was not somehow put on the wrong side of the spiritual elite and miscalculated the the power of mob violence or the malice of Roman government and accidentally ending up on the cross. No, he sovereignly chose to go to the cross and he did so for you and for me. Why does this matter? Our passage today is going to indicate that a life controlled by the gospel Living that life is done in part out of devotion to Christ, out of gratitude to Christ. And this fuel for every aspect of our lives, this this being empowered by the memory and knowledge of what Jesus has done, it only works if Jesus really was God in the flesh, sovereignly giving himself for us. And I want to illustrate that by pointing out how short our memory is relative when we are grateful for human sacrifices. Friends, we do not daily think of Nathan Hale saying he regretted that he only had one life to give for his country when we enjoy all the benefits of American liberty. We're grateful when we think about it, but it's probably been some time since you've thought of it. The great philosopher Socrates was sentenced to death unfairly, and we know from history that he actually was given an opportunity to escape, but refused choosing rather to be a martyr for his beliefs. But we do not consciously remember this sacrifice or let it shape our thinking and our lives. It has been a really long time since any Texan has said, remember the Alamo, to try and help them accomplish something, whether in, in, in battle or much less when they try to grow in their character. No human sacrifice could do what Jesus' sacrifice has done. To be the guiding, controlling factor for 2,000 years for millions of Christians speaking thousands of languages in hundreds of countries. But the sovereign gift of Jesus Christ for us can and has changed us. And beloved, I just want to call us all to let our hearts be touched by this right now. Be reminded and amazed at the words of Philippians 2, that though Jesus knew he was in the form of God, he made himself of no reputation and took the form of a servant and being found in human form, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. He was in control. He was in charge. He made the choice and he did it for you. Jesus gave himself for us. He has every right to then call us to live lives controlled 
by the gospel. So this is going to lead us to our second point, one that will be partially about Jesus' sacrifice and partially lead us to our passage. And that is, Jesus died for a purpose. He died for a purpose. Beloved, just as Jesus was sovereign over the giving of life, of his life, he was also sovereign over the purposes, the effects, the results that his sacrifice was meant to bring about in his people. And of course, we know that, again, not from speculation or deduction, but from the clear words of Scripture. We've already established Jesus gave himself. Uh, what does the Bible say was the reason for that? Galatians 1.4 says, Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Titus 2.14 says Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 1 Peter 3.18 says Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So among the many reasons that we may find in Scripture, these three at least are clear to us. To deliver us from sin, to purify us, and to bring us to God. All of these things from passages that clearly say that Jesus had purposes in mind in giving himself for us. And this clearly is just a representative list, not an exhaustive one. But here's the point. Our king... King Jesus, who was in control of every aspect of his sacrifice, was and is in control of every aspect of the results of his sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus knew 2,000 years ago and before that what he wanted done as a result of his sacrifice. In John 17, he prayed for his people, praying for all who would believe in him. He said in his time on earth that the Holy Spirit was coming, that it was going to lead us into all truth. He knew that his followers would be hated by the world, and he decrees that his people ought to be changed by the gospel. And that leads us into our passage. If you haven't already, I'd ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 11 through 15. And I'm going to read all five verses in a moment. But first, I'd just like to read the last two, verses 14 and 15. Here's what Paul says. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died, and was raised. Among the many things that Christ's death accomplished and the ways that we are supposed to change our conduct in light of the gospel, this is as helpful a summary as there is. We are called to live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ. We who live are called to no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and was raised. And this leads us to our third point. Christians must lead lives controlled by these realities. Christians must lead lives controlled by these realities. And again, in our passage, we are both going to see that that demand is on us, Christians. And we are going to see an example of that lived out in the life of Paul. So we're going to start there. We're going to start by looking at how Paul lived a life that was controlled by the gospel. And it's at this point that I am going to read the five verses of 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. 
If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. In these few short verses, there are many things Paul says that indicate to us the things that motivated him, that controlled him, that compelled him, the things that gave him confidence, the things that he was thinking about that empowered him to continue on in ministry, even in the face of persecution and unfair criticism. Let me show you some of these things that that were Paul's motivating factors in his ministry. First, Paul is controlled by knowing the fear of the Lord. He says that in verse 11. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we minister, or as he says, we persuade others. And of course, we we talked a good bit last week about the fear of the Lord and the balance of having a fear of the Lord while also having the assurance that Paul had, both the assurance of knowing where he was going and also, as we see in our passage, of knowing that that what he is before God, he's, he's comfortable with that. He isn't fearful in the sense of fear that he's going to be exposed as a fraud. Knowing the fear of the Lord is more complex than that. It's a balance that's hard to find. Proverbs 2, in fact, calls an understanding of the fear of the Lord one of the grand jewels of pursuing wisdom. It's it's the grand prize that then you will understand the fear of the Lord. But first, Peter says that living our lives with fear for the Lord is the appropriate response to knowing God as Father. So it is a balance. There's a, there's a security there while also being fearful. It's a hard balance to strike, but first, Peter says that it's what we all need to do. But in verse 11, Paul says that he does his ministry uh, again calling it persuading others. He does this because he knows God. He knows that he must be obedient to God, and he knows he must call people to be obedient to God. So Paul was controlled by the fear of the Lord. The passage also tells us he was confident in God's standards, first and foremost. He indicates this at the end of verse 11, where he shows that he knows that what he is is known to the Lord. Therefore, it doesn't matter what these false teachers think. Uh, This reminds me of 1 Peter, where it says that those who suffer according to God's will must entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. In other words, uh, we do not put our hope in being recognized and justified in this life. We are most concerned with what God thinks of us. And Paul uh, operated and lived his life out of that conviction that he was going to do right before God no matter what it cost him and no matter what people said about him. So he was controlled by the fear of the Lord. He was also controlled by the standards of the Lord. We've got to look to God's standards. We'll never please everyone, but we can please the Lord. Galatians 6 tells us not to grow tired of doing good, for in due season you will reap a reward. So Paul was motivated by the fear of the Lord. He was motivated and controlled and confident in God's standard. And he wanted to help this church to see with the eyes of faith. So he was motivated by helping and loving the church. We see that in verse 12. Look with me again at verse 12. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. This echoes what we've been talking about for weeks, that Paul didn't care about winning arguments with those who were criticizing him. But Paul cared that this church that he loved understood the gospel. And he wants these dear Christians in this dear church to know that as he's told them that they can see with the eyes of faith, 
And as with seeing the eye, with the eyes of faith, they can see the true nature of the gospel, the true nature of the Christian, and the true nature of the minister of the gospel. Now they don't have to listen to false teachers who tell them to look at the outward appearance anymore. Now they have the ammunition they need to say, no, we're not going to listen to that anymore. Again, not so that Paul can commend himself, that's what this passage says, but so that they would understand that God looks at the heart, not at outward appearance, as God said when he was choosing the king of Israel all those years ago. Paul was controlled by fear of the Lord. Paul was controlled by God's standards of whether he was right or not. Paul was controlled by love for Jesus and love for the church. In verse 13, we see another verse about Paul's motivation, about what controls him, where he says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. This is a verse like several others in 2 Corinthians where we can read between the lines or or hear the echoes of criticism. We can sense that he has been criticized as being beside himself, out of his mind at some points, and in his right mind at other times. Uh, So obviously, according to the false teachers, this man can't be trusted, and you ought to trust us instead. Well, a lot of commentators feel like this beside ourselves moment that Paul references is a reference to the times when Paul was intensely fighting for this church. Through tears and through anguish. Remember, Paul has a long history with this church. Multiple visits and multiple letters, including one that he calls a painful letter. And that his opponents had seized on this opportunity when Paul was burdened with with zeal for the gospel and for Christians. And claimed that he was crazy. He was out of his mind. And Paul's saying, I was willing to be intense like that for God. I'm willing to be intense and to to do what is right, even if I will be criticized for it. And I'm willing to do it for God. And then he says, when I'm in my right mind, it's for you. In other words, when I give you measured, wise instructions, it is for your health as a church. It is for your health as individual Christians. In summary, Paul was controlled in this verse by love for God and love for this church in all his behavior. And that leads us back to verses 14 and 15. In summary, Paul conducted his ministry under the control of the love of Christ because he understood that Christ died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died, and was raised. Everything that has come before this has been an expression of Paul living under that principle, that he is controlled and empowered and moved by his knowledge of this sacrifice. It's good for us to look at that as we continue our study of 2 Corinthians. But now we return to the second meaning of my title, that we are called to lead lives, controlled by the gospel. We need to respond to these truths the same way Paul did. We want to live for Christ. I mentioned uh, in great detail earlier about how Jesus gave himself. Uh, But look at all the benefits of what he did for us in these verses. One has died for all, we're told. This indicates, beloved, that Jesus took our punishment. The book of Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. No forgiveness of sins, none. No matter how innocent or harmless we think our sins might be, no matter how good we might think we are, no matter how low a regard we have for our sins, we need to recognize that we would not have been able to pay for one of them without the shedding of our blood. And Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for us. One has died for all. And Christ then calls us to live for him. Now Christians need training in how to do that. That's one of the reasons we meet weekly 
and hopefully throughout the week. That's one of the reasons we scour our Bibles and pray, because we're, we're trying to learn how to live a life that is controlled by the gospel. We're trying to learn how to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and was raised. But beloved, as a foundation, as a starting place, we need to be controlled by the love of Christ to live not for ourselves, but for him. You might fail to do this out of a lack of understanding of how to do this, but don't fail to live for Christ because you are not willing to. Don't fail to adjust your life to Scripture, being wise in your own eyes, as we are told in the Bible is the way of the fool, but be controlled by the love of Christ. You know, the Bible talks about sin, a lot of different ways, but one of the most helpful ways for me to think about sin, and it started in the garden, was that people want to live as if they are God. We want to be king. We want to be in charge. We do not want to yield to authority, the authority of God. And this passage tells us that we can be freed from that. We can be freed from living for ourselves, freed from being idolaters at the altar of self. Jesus has done this for us, has made this possible. And I want to add two notes of encouragement on this, this lifestyle. First, I want to encourage you, beloved. There's fuel for this. What God has called us to do, God also helps us do. With his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, as chapter 5 has already told us, with his word that is profitable for training and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. With prayer where we can boldly come to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. These things that we're saying are the appropriate response for the Christian God is longing to do inside of you. God is longing you to, to longing to make you look more like Christ. Romans 8, that, that you would be conformed into the image of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, that as we gaze on Christ, we'd be transformed into the same image. This is not something you're called to do on your own power. This is something that God wants to do through you. That's my first note of encouragement. And secondly, let me just remind you that living for Christ is so much better, so much more refreshing than the alternatives. If we live for ourselves as Adam and Eve did in the garden, if we make ourselves God, then James tells us what will happen. James tells us that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. As clear as can be in the book of James, we see that a, a, a clear uh, transaction from worshiping self, the end result will be death. Living for Christ is so much better than that. It is also better than legalism and self-righteousness. Living for some reward that we think we are constructing some credit that we are earning that we think God will have to honor. Some social credit that we think will give us power. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said of this kind of lifestyle that if you are legalistic, if you live your life for, for rewards of attention, then you have your reward in full. There's nothing more coming for you. But the Bible tells us that those who love God who love him, not just those who appear to love him, who love him, uh, that he has waiting for them the unfading crown of life. So living no longer for yourself, but for Christ is obtainable through Christ. And I want to encourage you of that. You have fuel for this. And it is better than any other lifestyle that we can imagine. Well, I hope that our, our hearts have been stirred by the good work of Jesus on our behalf. I have to tell you, in writing this sermon, uh, it, was, it was one of the most worshipful 
writing experiences I've had thinking about Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. I hope you're moved to worship. I hope your heart is softened to do whatever it takes to follow Christ. But now I'd like to conclude this message by looking forward to next week. I don't know if you noticed it, but the last part of our verse says that we would live no longer for ourselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And we're going to celebrate that next week, beloved. We're going to look forward to that and, 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 and think about Jesus' resurrection. We're going to think about the promise that it has for us that we have been raised, the promise that it holds for us that we will be raised as as our passage told us uh, last week, I believe, that we will be raised with one another to be in the presence of Jesus. We're going to look forward to that and we're going to celebrate that together next week. And I want to remind you that as Jesus was sovereign over his death, Jesus was also sovereign over his resurrection. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And we're told he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus said, no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of whale, so the Son of Man must be in the earth for three days. Jesus knew as he set his face to go to Jerusalem, the passage tells us that the time of his ascension was near. How did he get from death to ascension? Jesus knew. He knew that he would rise from the dead. Be ascended into heaven and intercede for you and me. So when we say that the love of Christ ought to control us, we know that we are referring to a risen Christ who loves us now. When we see that we must live for him, we see that we are living for a risen Lord, one who is preparing a place for us now and who will come back for us. Beloved, what better thought to leave off with as we continue to live lives affected by this pandemic. Our risen Savior is working for us now, is and has been sovereign over his death, his resurrection, and his work for us in heaven. And he will come back for us. He is coming back for us, and the Word tells us He is the one who makes all things new. Let's live for Him and say, as the, as the Bible says, even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, help us to do this. Help us to be controlled by the, the truths of Your Word and help us to have affection, real affection in our hearts for Jesus because of what you've done, because of who you are, because of what you are doing in our hearts. And Lord, let us look forward with joy and anticipation to the day when every trial we've experienced will be a distant memory as we soak in your presence and, and praise you and worship you for all eternity. We love you, Lord. Come quickly. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.